Good evening and welcome to the 5th Yale and US College President Speaker Series event of the academic year. My name is Yong Zhi. I'm a second year student here at Yale and US College, considering a major in politics, philosophy, and economics. We are thrilled to have with us here today Professors Daniel Bell and Philip Pettit, who will debate on the topic how much democracy, how much meritocracy. I'm eager to hear the arguments as my interest in political philosophy has led me to think on the questions of ability and agency, participation and power. From our modern social thought classes, juxtaposing talk views, ideas on democratic despotism against the rationalized Weberian meritocratic, meritocratic machine. Democracy and meritocracy are two normative goods that have become strange bedfellows, often in love, sometimes not, and always heatedly passionate. Let me invite Professor Pericles Lewis, President of Yale and U.S. College, on stage to give his opening remarks. Please join me in welcoming President Lewis. Thank you, Yongshu, and thank you everybody for being here tonight. Uh, we at Yale and U.S. College are honored to be hosting uh, two such distinguished philosophers. Uh, for a debate that I think is quite relevant to Yale and U.S. and its mission. I've taken uh, to, I, I no longer refer as frequently as I used to to uh, encounters between East and West because people tend to find it, um, especially academics tend to, tend to find it oversimplifying, essentializing, uh, cliche, and so on. Nonetheless, Yale and U.S. is a place where there are a lot of encounters between Asian and Western uh, civilizations, philosophies, ways of uh, living and doing things. Uh, and of course, there are more complex and more local matters here. It's not just Asia and the West. It's also here in Singapore, a place where meritocracy is of great importance, democracy too. But there's a lot of conversation about these two things. Uh, our guests uh, have taught in China, in Australia, in the United States, in Canada. And so they bring, uh, and in fact, here in Singapore. And so they bring a remarkable range of perspectives, and I think I asked them whether they've actually engaged in a formal debate in the past. They've had many, many conversations, but I think we're lucky to host their first formal debate. And I think it's very appropriate uh, location and, and occasion for this debate. So thank you all for being here, and welcome to our two distinguished guests. Thank you, President Lewis. Let me introduce our host and moderator for this evening, Associate Professor in Political Science, Kristina Tanapolsky. Professor Tanapolsky received her BA in Joint Honours in Political Science and Philosophy from the, from the University of Toronto in 1994. Sorry. She thereafter earned her MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of Chicago in 1996 and 2002, respectively. While at the University of Chicago, Professor Tarnopolsky received the APSA Leo Strauss Award for Best Doctoral Dissertation in Political Philosophy in 2004. Prior to joining Yale and US, Professor Tarnopolsky's main area of research was ancient Greek political philosophy and contemporary democratic theory, with a specific focus on the role of emotions in politics. Professor Tarnopolsky's desire to join Yale and US was motivated by a desire to learn and do research in comparative political theory and to teach a, tr a truly global curriculum. Professor Tarnopolsky has begun to develop a research project that will compare Plato's theories of ethical cultivation, exemplarity, and mimetic pedagogy in the theories of ancient Confucian philosophers, Kongzi, Mengzi, and Xunzi. Uh, let me now welcome Professor Tarnopolsky to, in to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Yongzha. It is indeed our pleasure tonight to welcome Daniel Bell, Chair Professor of the Schwartzman Scholars Program of Tsinghua University and Director of the Bergruen Philosophy and Culture Center, 
and Philip Pettit, L.S. Rockefeller University Professor of Politics and Human Values at Princeton University and Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the Australian National University. Professor Bell has held teaching posts in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, and research fellowships at Princeton, Stanford, and Hebrew University. His talk tonight will draw on his recently published book, The China Model, Political Meritocracy and the Limits of Democracy. His other books include Spirit of Cities, China's New Confucianism, Beyond Liberal Democracy, and East Meets West. And he is the editor of the Princeton China series. Professor Pettit's books include Republicanism, The Economy of Esteem, Group Agency, On the People's Terms, Just Freedom, and his most recent book, The Robust Demands of the Good. He is a fellow of the Australian Academies of Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as the American Academies of Arts and Sciences, the British Academy, and the Royal Irish Academy. The debate tonight, as I mentioned, will focus on Professor Bell's argument in the, uh, his recently published book, The China Model. Uh, the debate will proceed as follows. Professor Bell will have 25 minutes to articulate his argument. Then Professor Pettit will respond for 25 minutes. And then each of them will have a, another chance to respond to each other's arguments for five minutes. And then we'll toss the discussion out to the floor for about half an hour. And if you do have questions, please use the uh, speakers at the front of, near the front of the stage. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I must say, it's, I, I, my first job was in Singapore. I have a very soft spot for the place. Um, the only thing is I realize that I'm debating Philip Pettit, who to my mind is a great thinker as well as a very kind and considerate person. And if I didn't know that it was me debating, I would strongly urge you to vote for him. <laughs> in fact, even knowing that it's me, I would still urge you to vote for him. But anyway, let me do my best. Um, the, one thing about Yale and US, I think, is that it's a beautiful experiment. It, it, there's really more of a need for this sort of um, education in this part of the world. And I, and I, to be frank, I hope that it spreads to China as well. So I'm, I'm also here to learn about the experiment. I also want to describe the Chinese political system as a kind of experiment. And I also hope that it succeeds. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, I think the experiment, I'm just going to use the label of vertical democratic meritocracy. I'm going to explain a bit what that means. But before I go into that, let me just say a little bit about uh, definitions, okay? What I mean by political meritocracy, it's a fairly simple idea. It's the idea that the political system should aim to select and promote leaders with superior qualities, superior intelligence, social skills, and virtue. And of course, we're familiar with this uh, language in Singapore. Uh, but sometimes in Singapore, language meritocracy is used to refer to distribution of economic resources. You know, that economic resources should go to those who work hard or who have talent um, or who contribute more as opposed to based on family or class background. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about political meritocracy. And again, the word political refers specifically to the selection and promotion of leaders who exercise authority in a wide range of domains, you know, because in the West, as you know, there's a strong division between the civil servants, who are supposed to be chosen by more meritocratic means, such as examinations, and the elected leaders, who are supposed to exer exercise political power. And in principle, the elected leaders have authority over the civil servants, who are supposed to implement. Or sometimes you have institutions like the Federal Reserve or the Supreme Court of Justice, where they're also supposed to be meritocratically chosen. But in some sense, they're chosen at a very basic level by the elected leaders, and they exercise authority in a narrow range of, dom of, of, of well, in a narrow uh, domain. So I'm referring to the selection and promotion of leaders, political leaders who are supposed to exercise their political judgment in a wide range of affairs. And that's more or less the system, I think, that you have in China as a model. I'm going to explain a bit what I mean by that. Let me first say what I, you know, what really um, motivated the book. Okay, I had been working a lot more in Confucian philosophy, but it's more detached from 
the kind of actual politics of China, thinking about what models might be appropriate that are inspired by Confucianism. You know, Confucian strongly, there's a long history in Confucianism about how to choose leaders with superior qualities, which qualities matter, what are the best mechanisms for selecting those leaders. And I had been working on that kind of separate from the actual political system or history of China. But then I noticed that over the past three decades, a very interesting phenomenon has happened. Throughout Chinese history, like imperial Chinese history, like for about 1,300 years up to the collapse of the examination system, and I'm simplifying it here, but leaders were chosen first by examinations and then by performance evaluations at lower levels of government. And that's almost the same system that has been established in form, not necessarily in content, over the past three decades in China. That first, public officials are selected by examinations and then promoted based on performance evaluations at lower levels of government. And I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. And I, based on these kind of uh, emerging ideas, I don't want to say half-baked, I wrote some op-eds in newspapers like the Financial Times and New York Times and so on. And I was massacred by my friends, not just liberal friends, but Confucian friends who saying, what happened to this guy? He's, he's now turned into an apologist for the Chinese Communist Party. What, what? So I said, okay, fine. I'm not going to write anything in the newspapers anymore. I'm going to just spend a few years writing a book where my ideas could be laid out in a more systematic way, balanced, you know, tons of footnotes, qualifications, elaborations, and so on. And I came here to write my book because I wanted free access to the internet, which I couldn't get in China, as well as a good library in uh, both English and Chinese. So I wrote most of the book here two years ago. Um, so I, again, I want to thank Singapore for that. Well, maybe you won't thank us once you read the book. Anyway, um, so what is my method? Well, my method, I mean, is very interdisciplinary because in political science, to be frank, and even in political theory, in Western political theory, there's not much on this question of, you know, what are the relevant qualities of political leaders? And what are the best mechanisms to select those leaders? Because there's been almost a consensus in the West that we just select leaders, political leaders, by means of one person, one vote, across the board, no matter what the level of government, no matter what the country, what the political context, there's just one way of selecting leaders. Now, it doesn't take a lot of thought to realize that this is a bit of a dogmatic view, and although because it's so, like I'm from Montreal, so it's, you know, you're deeply Im Im embedded in this view, it's, it takes a, a lot of hard knocks to one's moral system to question it, and fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, living in Beijing for so many years, I've been there 12 years, led me to question that view. So what is my approach then? Well, we can call it contextual political theory. I try to take the leading ideas in the public culture of the society in which I find myself and make those ideas into a little bit more systematic or, co or coherent or rationally defensible than they would have been otherwise. And I think the leading idea in the public culture of China really is this idea of vertical democratic meritocracy. And I'm going to explain a bit what I mean by that. And I'm going to begin with two assumptions that are not very controversial. The first is that democracy is a good thing, right? I don't think anybody here would uh, object to this view that, you know, as, as citizens, as people, we want to have some sort of say in the, in the government. We don't want to be ruled in a totally, uh, un, by rulers who are totally unaccountable. You know, unless you're North Korean, you know, basically including in China, people think democracy is a good thing. There's a famous uh, article now, book in China called, Minju Shi Ge Hao Dong Xi, you know, democracy is a good thing. Okay, not much debate about that. The other assumption, I, which I don't think is very controversial, but it's a little bit counterintuitive if you're from a kind of Western context, is that political meritocracy is a good thing. If you're kind of a you know, semi-reasonable person, you want to be ruled by a leader who has superior qualities, who is, you know, at least has, for example, above average intelligence, or who doesn't have below average intelligence. If you're a leader of a huge country like China, you, know, you want leaders who aren't going to make you know, basic you know, mistakes about uh, understanding, you know, w what's the difference between North Korea and South Korea, uh, you know, or about the science of climate change. You know, you want leaders who have a good grasp of how the empirical world works and our ability to take some sort of informed decisions about how to deal with the uh, world. 
We also want leaders, I don't think it's very controversial either, who are virtuous in the minimal sense that they're not corrupt. They're not going to misuse public resources for their own private gain, right? I mean, that's, you know, nobody, I think, is, is, would want to be ruled by a corrupt ruler if they have a choice, right? Okay, so those assumptions are not very controversial, I think. The question is, how can we reconcile democracy and meritocracy? Hugely important question, not often asked in debates in Western political theory, very important in a Chinese context. And I'm going to give three kind of answers to that question and argue that the last model, which again I'm going to call vertical democratic meritocracy, is the best model. And it's also one that has been informing political reform in China over the past three decades. Still a big gap between the reality and the practice, but I think it's a good model that should continue to inform political reform. So very quickly, what are the alternative models? Well, the first model is, you know, when I give this talk, I'm spending most of this term in the U.S., you know, and people say, well, what's the problem? Just leave it to voters to decide. The voters will pick, you know, wise and, and virtuous rulers. You don't have to think of, you don't have to agonize too much over this question. That's what people used to think in China, 1980s, when I first began to engage with China, the typical thing would be, oh, you know, Chinese people are kind of low quality, but once we get educated, then we'll become high quality. Well, it turns out that, and I went in this with an open mind, but if you look at the social science of the wisdom of voters in the U.S., turns out that they're also very low quality. It's depressing, just the, you know, the lack of wisdom and virtue at, um, in terms of the average voter. And this is not very controversial. Just, there's a book you know, published again by Princeton called The Myth of the Rational Voter by an economist who shows that on basic economic issues that economists don't really argue over, voters are systematically ill-informed. Um, Another thing is voting is not just a matter of voting for your own interests, right? It's not like going to a movie, I just want to go to a movie that entertains me, that's it. When you vote, you're choosing leaders who affect not just yourself, but affect other people. So you want voters to be at least a little bit other regarding. And here too, there's a big problem with, let's call it the virtue of the average voter. Um, even when voters are kind of rational and virtuous, even when democracy works well, um, typically the system is to the advantage of the voting community. The problem here is that the policies of the government don't just affect the voting community, they affect non-voters, future generations, especially in a big country, people outside the country. Nobody represents their interests. So if there's a serious conflict of interest between the interests of voters and the interests of non-voters on issues like climate change, unfortunately, in a kind of a democratic context, the interests of voters will typically have priority. So how do you deal with that? Well, in the 19th century, actually, the debates were much more open. You know, John Stuart Mill could say, well, of course not everybody has equal capacity to make uh, political judgments, so let's select those with above average capacity and give them extra voting power. Give it to the educated people. That, you probably know in Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew made a very similar argument, right? He said, but it wasn't educated, but he says, give it to like, people who have families who aren't too young, not too old. They're going to be more responsible because they'll look after their kids' interests. Those, uh, unfortunately, are kind of non-starters in democratic societies because once you have one person, one vote in place, it's almost impossible to change the system. People don't want to give up the power, no matter how you know, bad the results. Um, and it's very hard to draw the line between those who are you know, above quality and less above average quality in a way that's not controversial. So what are some other possible models? Well, one possible model, we can call it a horizontal model, and this is at the level of central government. Think of, we can have two houses of government where one is the leaders are selected by the vote, democratic house, and the other by more meritocratic mechanisms such as, let's say, examinations and performance evaluations at lower levels of government. In theory, that sounds like a pretty good idea, right? And many uh, Confucian thinkers, especially in China, have, have proposed similar ideas. In fact, well, it's not exactly the same idea, but Sun Yat-sen, you know, uh, who's regarded as a founding father by both mainland China and Taiwan, he proposed an idea of having a reconciling meritocracy and democracy at the central government. He says, well, look, let's have the vote. People select their leaders. But then to serve in government, they have to pass an examination. Could be a simple examination, almost like a driving test, you know, but at least you should have some basic knowledge. Um, and that was never implemented, right? Why? Again, because, well, just imagine if, um, if I get 
uh, 80% of the vote and Philip gets 20% of the vote, you know, and I fail the examinations and Philip passes the examination, so he would be in government, but would he be viewed as legitimate? You know, not likely, right? So anyway, the, the point is that, and, and I have like, and when I was here, uh, she's not here, there was an Italian student, um, PhD student, who proposed a very good idea for Italy. She was very frustrated by, by populism, and she said, um, why can't we just have a simple test? Ask voters 10 multiple choice questions, knowledge of two political parties. That way, that way and, and only if you could pass that test, then could you have the right to vote. I think it's not a bad idea. Impossible to implement. You know, once you have one person one vote, just people don't want to modify it, no matter how good the case is for alternatives. It really is the end of history, but in a bad sense that you can't improve the system. Okay, so what about these ideas in the Chinese context, for example, and I, including myself in earlier works, but I've now changed my mind saying, well, why can't, in China, there's a strong history of uh, political meritocracy. According to political surveys, people support political meritocracy. Why can't we have that in China, where there's like a one democratic house and one meritocratic house? The problem is that, and I don't think it depends so much on the context, that once you have a democratic house, in, almost inevitably, it's going to have more and more legitimacy and marginalize the other house of government. Think of the UK, the House of Lords. The debates in the House of Lords are much more deliberative, well-informed than the ones in the House of Commons. Um, and the House of Lords has become more meritocratic. It used to be an aristocratic institution. You were there because you were born into a certain family with lots of land and wealth. Now, they select, you know, literally the kind of meritocratic elites from diverse sectors of society. It's a little bit politicized, but still a pretty good institution. All the parties are against it because it's not viewed as, as, as democratic. I think something similar would happen in China. So what's a better model then? Well, here's where I'm going to say it's the vertical model. Democracy, and here Western political theorists have made the same point, right? All the way from Aristotle to Rousseau, you know, to Montesquieu, you know, that democracy works best at the local level because there you know the, uh, the issues are not so complicated. You build a road here, a road there, you know, it, as opposed to like managing China at the central level, hugely complicated issues, requires a lot of, you know, skill, intelligence, experience, and so on. Um, it's easier to generate a sense of community at the local level. People can be more public spirited. Um, it, you know the moral quality of the, of the leaders that you vote for. There's a very good case for democracy at the local level. Like even Jean-Jacques Rousseau, famous for arguing for strong participatory democracy at the local level, when he was asked to advise the government of Poland on government, then he was much more you know, in favor of le much less democratic means. So, the basic point here is that as a society, as you go up the chain of political command, especially a huge and complex country like China, it's important for political leaders to have more experience, more training, higher intelligence, social skills, and virtue. In other words, the system should become more meritocratic as you go up the chain of political command. So the basic model here is democracy at the local level, and as you further go up the chain of political command, the system should become more meritocratic. What about in between? In between, you don't exactly know what's going to work, what's not, what counts as merit, what are the key issues. Allow for lots of experimentation. Experimentation at, in between local and central level. See what works, what doesn't. If it works, you can generalize it to the rest of the country. If it doesn't, you could stop the experiment. Strangely enough, if you read the Western media, you think, oh, no political reform in China. Lots of economic reform, but no political reform because the assumption is only electoral democracy counts as political reform. If you leave that assumption aside, there's been tons of political reform over the past three decades, and basically, it's been motivated by this model. Democracy at the local level, in village elections are very widespread in China. Hundreds of millions of people have participated in village elections. Lots of experimentation between, some of it economic in nature, you know, most famously Shenzhen, you start market reforms in Shenzhen, generalize the rest of China, but also political experimentation about how to select and promote leaders, and more meritocracy at higher levels of government, more emphasis on examinations as well as performance evaluations at lower levels of government. That's been the model that has inspired political change over the past three decades in China, but there's still a large gap between the ideal and the reality. What are some of the key issues? Well, there's at least three. The first is that it's not sufficiently democratic. The elections at the local level, at the village level, are often, you know, uh, sometimes corrupt. Sometimes the leaders selected don't exercise real power. Um, sometimes, when, even when they do have real power, they misuse their power. I think it's, I've done lots of social science, uh, you know, readings on this. It's getting improved the past three decades, but still a big gap between the ideal and the reality. 
In other parts of democratic values and practices, consultation, deliberation, transparency are all great. But as you know, the Chinese political system is not as open and transparent and deliberative and consultative as it should be. Still a huge gap between that. And you can have those democratic values and practices at higher levels of government as well. So not sufficiently democratic, not sufficiently scientific. What do I mean by that? That who decides on whether the experiments at, in between local and central levels of government are successful, it tends to be a very politicized process. Whether you have a certain ties with a patron, that often determines the success and failure of experiments. As opposed to having, for example, an independent board of experts assessing the success of the experiments. So the system could become more scientific and also more meritocratic. Actually, above, the, at the city level and above, very few people who know and who have encountered the uh, p political leaders in China doubt their ability. The big problem is corruption. The system is very corrupt, as we know. And that's a big problem for meritocracy, because in a democracy, if the leaders are corrupt, you can vote them out of power, right? If they're still corrupt, you vote them out of power again. It's, a prob it's not a problem with the democratic system. At the end of the day, if there's always corruption, then it's a problem with the people, to be frank, not with the democratic system. But in a meritocracy, if the leaders are corrupt, it means that it's not meritocratic. Because the whole point is that you want leaders who have superior ability, social skills, and virtue. If they're corrupt, they're not virtuous. Therefore, the system is not meritocratic. So it's a stake in the heart of the system. And that's part of why there's been the longest and most systematic anti-corruption drive in Chinese history, not just Communist Party history, uh, is really to address this problem. If the corruption problem is not addressed, the system really is in a kind of faces an existential threat. And it's not just me who's saying that. The Chinese leaders uh, say that as well. So, how, so then, my point here is that we have a good model here, right? A, a good model has inspired political change, still a big gap between the ideal and the reality, but the model can and should serve as an high standard for judging further political regress and progress. That instead of using these kind of, you know, Western ideas has to be like electoral democracy, otherwise there's nothing happening. Let's, this model is rooted in Chinese history, it's inspired political change over the past three decades and has very strong support according to political surveys in China. So let's encourage the success of the experiment based on the current model. That's all I'm saying. Or put it differently, what would, what would it mean for the uh, experiment to fail? Well, lots of things could happen, right? Could be military dictatorship, you know, uh, or just imagine if like President Xi Jinping decides not to relinquish power. Um, oh, I can't, I'm finished in one, in one minute, you know. Um, and then just abolishes examination, all the other meritocratic uh, mechanisms. You know that would be that would be terrible. Well, let's say some of my you know liberal uh, friends would say, and I'm a liberal by the way on freedom of speech and rule of law, totally liberal. So, but not on this issue using one person one vote to select leaders. What if one person one vote was used to select leaders? Like saying people say, oh look, you have it in Taiwan. Why can't you have it in mainland China? Well, what would happen? I mean, the worst case scenario is you would have this kind of populism. Like now, at least the system could filter out the true duds. You know, nobody gets in there, you know, with who, who like, no way could, like, sorry, from Toronto, do we, nobody, like Rob Forb, you know, or, or Sarah Palin couldn't get through the system, forget about it. You have to have lots of political experience. If you have one person, one vote, that wouldn't matter anymore. The leaders can take long-term decisions, like on climate change, you know. President Shin Obama can say, this is what we're going to do by the year 2030. Who's going to stick to that deal? If the Republicans win in the U.S., forget about it. In China, unless the whole system collapses, uh, you know, we can assume they're going to stick to the deal, right? So, if the system fails, which means, it could mean, it becomes more democratic in the sense that there's one person, one vote at the top. You can say goodbye to filters uh, that, you know, deselect the truly, you know, stupid ones. You can say goodbye to political experience as, as a mechanism. You can say goodbye to long-term plan. You can also say goodbye to experimentation because for the experiments to work, sometimes they take years, if not decades, to bear fruit. You have to have stability at the top. China is exporting this model of experimentation to some places, for example, in Africa. But if there's a change of government, whoop, the experiments are, are ended. You know, so, so I do think we should encourage uh, further reform based on the current model and hope for the success of the experiment both at Yale and US and in China. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. I must say I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm very grateful to President Lewis and Yale NUS for sponsoring this event. 
I'm also very grateful to Daniel for writing this book. I deeply disagree with it, as I'm going to try to indicate, but I think we, should, we owe him a, a real debt of gratitude in thinking about democratic theory as to um, what the features are that distinguish it from the sort of meritocratic uh, ideal that, um, uh, that Daniel has described. So let me just get right in, given there's 25 minutes and counting. Um, this is a model that's our, a diagram that's meant to give you a picture of what I see as the two models. I call them the China model and the Western model. Western model because it's not just US. I think if I have a complaint about Daniel's book, um, it's that he focuses very much on, on the United States as the model of a democracy, whereas I think the United States, which is certainly the great founding democracy of modern times, is really, it's working with very old technology. A constitution established in 1787, itself a wonderful constitution, but really it's shown itself to have serious problems, which I think have been rectified in many other um, democracies, mainly by an evolutionary process. Uh, so I would much prefer to think of uh, parliamentary democracies. And yeah, let's call it the Western model. Also, he focuses very much on elective democracy, where I think of democracy, and I agree this is something that we could debate, but I think of democracy as a system on which the demos has kratos. That means the people have control, presumptively equally shared control in some way. Now, that doesn't just mean that you elect. Having control has many dimensions to it. But I'll come to that in a moment. Here are the two models as I see them. The one at the top, which is the China model as Daniel describes it in his book, it's very much a triangle. You've got a large population at the bottom uh, spread throughout the cities and villages of, of China. Uh, his model, as he describes it to you, the vertical model, involves democracy at this level. So in the parishes, you have a good deal of local democracy. I'm sorry, in the... <laughs> In the, uh, in the villages, you have a good deal of local democracy. Uh, the dark arrows indicate there a, um, a democratic mode of selection of the authorities. So the bottom, village democracy, selection by the people. And then he's got two other layers, middle government, which is a large layer. And as he said, he likes to, the idea of there being uh, experimentation and how exactly things should be done in middle government. And then at the top, you've got leadership. Um, the entry to middle government, however, is entirely, and these are the gray arrows, is entirely meritocratic. It's by examination, for example. And the movement from middle government into the leadership is equally by meritocratic criteria, in this case by performance, evaluation, and so on, everything that, that he talked about. Uh, of course, middle government, and indeed the leadership, breaks up into various functional units uh, concerned with lawmaking, administration, the courts, and so on. But these on on this model are all part of, it's the same personnel who move around between these offices exercising these different functions. In particular, as he stressed in his presentation, there isn't a deep divide between the political and the bureaucratic, or the professional, if you like. Um, the people who enter on a meritocratic basis, those gray arrows from the side, as younger people or progress upwards, maybe into the leadership, there are people who share uh, what in other systems you might describe as professional on the one hand, or political officers on the other. They, they merge into one. Now, if you think of the Western models, I think that by contrast with that model, looking at the Lord diagram here, I think there are a number of features to pick out that distinguish the two models. First of all, of course, uh, there is both meritocratic and democratic modes of entry or selection in both models, but the models differ very greatly in the extent uh, in the, the division between these, where democracy is restricted to the village level and vertical model described by Daniel. In this model, of course, we've got typically, this is typical, obviously, we've got two houses, the legislative chambers, let those be the ones in the middle on the left and the right of the central one, and we've got the executive. In a parliamentary system, we elect into each of those houses, again, variations between systems, but I think Australia, because that's exactly what happens in Australia, with which I'm, I'm familiar. Election into both of those houses, and then the executive, that's the dotted line, is elected by the members of those houses, by the party or the coalition that has gained control of the legislative chambers. Uh, or, as in the US or the presidential model, you can have democratic entry 
separately from the democratic entry into the legislative chambers, into the middle, that's to say, into the executive government, as in the election of the president and the selection by him of his or her administration. Okay, but apart what's very important in the Western model, as I'm describing it here, is that there are a number of triangles, and that indicates these triangles are always in a bit of tension with one another. This is the very ancient idea described, for example, uh, first of all, really in detail by Polybius in the uh, second century BC, describing Rome, the idea of a mixed constitution, where you've got many different centers of power that play off against one another, thereby giving us safety, I would say. But apart from the three big triangles in the middle, I have these unelected bodies with purely meritocratic entry on the sides. What are they? Well, I've mentioned them in the handout, actually. They include bodies like the following. The auditor, uh, the aud an auditing body. So, for example, every standard Western um, uh, democracy has got an auditor general. And that person and his or her office is appointed quite independently of government, or if appointed by government, is, power is not exercised at the pleasure of government. The government can't dismiss the auditor. The auditor has independent power of reviewing government and giving a very negative report, which can, of course, have an enormous impact on government. Equally, it incurs ombudsman bodies, you know, which have become a feature of Western democracy in particular, where you've got a body that's, again, independent from the elected government and the executive, and which can hear complaints from the public and give, with whatever degree of sanction available, certainly give publicity to those complaints. Again, elected bodies, the elected people in these three central areas, are going to worry about those bodies. They keep them honest, as you might say. There was a great phrase in Australian politics, if you forgive the sort of rough edge of it, which was, keep the bastards honest. That's what you really need, and you need these bodies in order to do that. Apart from, there are, of course, the courts, as they main sort of unelected body, but apart from the courts, the auditor bodies, the ombudsman bodies, you equally, of course, get regulatory bodies of various kinds. Very, very important, which are independent again, to a good extent at any rate. And you get bodies that do jobs which, um, uh, I've put it here, that do arm's length jobs, which are best done by people appointed on the basis of merit, um, independent from those elected, and operating in the sense that they don't just operate at the pleasure of government. So, for example, an electoral commission, uh, a commission that decides on how the boundaries are drawn. You can only have democratic representation if you've got a body that itself is not democratically elected, which decides on the basis of a brief, on the basis of terms, which certainly can be established or tested by the people or challenged, decides on the basis of accepted terms, where the boundaries should be drawn and when a, an election is fair, and so on. But equally, you get, for example, a central bank. Again, a sort of question on which elected representatives are often, they have an Achilles heel, they have a weakness, which is they can be subject to immediate electoral pressure, better put it at arm's length. These and, um, for example, informational bodies as well, for a Bureau of Statistics. Every serious democracy has a Bureau of Statistics where, again, the People who run it may be appointed by those elected, but they do not hold or keep office just insofar as those elected like them there. They're appointed across all of these bodies, typically. They're appointed for set terms, or even exceptionally for life, and they cannot be dismissed by those who are elected. Now, that's all very much part of a democratic system that gives the demos kratos our control, because through these Unelected bodies, but bodies which operate according to a brief that the elected bodies determine, that we the people can change, uh, they operate in our interests when that's essential, apart from the, uh, uh, to complement what's done by the elected bodies. The other aspect in which it's part of the control by the people are these curved arrows, because in a Western model, you always have contestatory possibilities of various kinds. And these are possibilities open to regular people. So, for example, you can, you can demonstrate. Uh, you can write the letter to the press. You can stand for parliament. You can join an action group. In every decent democracy, there are a million NGOs you can join, which can press cases against government, which can publicize what government is doing. 
It's no accident that it was an NGO that first blew the whistle on Volkswagen, for example. It's NGOs of this kind, manned by people on a voluntary basis, that really are the backbone of democracy. So all of these, uh, the fact that you've got a number of legislative and executive houses or officers that play off against one another, you've got the unelected bodies that represent aspects of public interest that are independent, that check those elected, and the fact that we the people can always contest. So democracy is not just about election. There are, of course, these black arrows, very important. It's a very important part of it. But it's not just about election. It's about this total system of control that has evolved over a long period and that is still faithful to the original image of the, of the mixed constitution. Now, how do these bodies uh, compare? Christina may ask, how long have I been going? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. OK, so I've got 15 <laughs> and no more. Um, so the question is, how do we judge these two models? And I'm, as Daniel did, I'm abstracting from all our systems in practice are imperfect, of course, but we're talking about how best to organize government in the world that the next generation is going to inherit. And that's going to be a very unstable, difficult world, a world in which there's almost certainly rising sea levels, for example, perhaps the end of antibiotics, a world in which there are huge challenges for government, movements of people, threats between nations, Above all, what you need is a structure of government that is really going to be resilient and serve us well, serve people, the people who live under that government well, in these coming uh, decades. Now, my firm belief is that the Western model offers more hope than the China model, and I want to try to argue that. But let's take an assumption, first of all, which itself could be questioned, which is let's assume that um, the meritocratic model or the democratic model at least have the following feature in common. They each identify a feature, on the one hand, popular control, on the other hand, professional merit, where merit includes virtue and social skills of the kind Daniel talked about. And they each say that um, government should be legitimated on the basis, on the one hand, of the popular control it gives people, on the other, of the professional merit it ensures the presence of in government. So these are two legitimators, as I think of them, popular control and professional merit. And let's assume that, um, that either would work in principle, that there's no objection in principle to the idea that a system can be made acceptable to people in general by virtue of being really established that there's professional merit is governing, determining how we're governed on the one hand, or on the other hand, at least it's a government that is subject to a relatively equally shared popular uh, control. Let's assume that. The three questions then, if you make that assumption to ask, and these are the questions I'm going to consider one by one, the first, the first question is, is that legitimator, on the one hand, popular control, on the other, uh, professional merit, is that legitimator actually likely to be realized? Is it likely to be the case in a real world system based on general assumptions about human nature, that we can have a system where there really is professional merit ruling among the ruling classes? Or is it likely that there really is a degree equally shared popular control? Because, of course, a legitimator is not going to be very persuasive unless you think, yes, we can really get that. You know, that's not unobtainable. Second question, though, if it is obtained, if you really did have it in place, would it be manifest to people? a matter of shared, obvious perception, everyone agrees on it, that it is present, because it's going to be really important, of course, not just that the professional merit that legitimates the system or the popular control that legitimates the system, it's not just going to be important that it's present, it's going to be important that it's seen to be present, believed to be present, if indeed it is present. And then the third question, assuming that it is present and manifestly present, seen to be present, is it the sort of legitimator that continues to support government, even when there is a dip in the performance of government, as there always will be? So let me turn to those three questions. Let's take the first question. Is the proposed legitimator, as I put it here, of the system, be it merit or control, is it likely to materialize in practice? Well, here's my first real reservation about the China model, as Daniel describes it. Um, and it's the following, that 
It's one thing to have a system whereby you select people of merit, uh, say professional merit, uh, intellectual merit, but equally and that's important, social virtue, social skill. It's one thing to have a system whereby you select those out. It's quite a distinct thing to have a system that keeps them virtuous, that keeps them deserving, so to speak, um, that keeps them worthy or meritorious. And now, of course, there is the oldest adage in Western politics, which I happen to be persuaded by, is that all power corrupts. And as you know, the Lord Acton phrase, an absolute power corrupts absolutely. But let's just stick with the first, all power corrupts. Polybius already had that in the second century. Cicero, who's his follower in a way, takes it up from him. And it's passed on through, think of, you know, the great medieval thinkers, Aquinas for one, or uh, Machiavelli for another. Think of the 17th century English thinkers, like Locke, for example, Harrington, uh, Sidney, uh, or think of the 18th century thinkers, uh, like the founders of the, uh, of the United States, for example, of Madison, or Jay, or Hamilton. They all stress this belief that if you give somebody power and they're not checked in the exercise of that power, seriously, openly checked, then that power tends to corrupt. It goes back, actually, to the story of the Ring of Gyges. You know the Ring of Gyges, which Plato tells us about. In fact, it's an older story from, from Plato. Uh, you're, you imagine that you're given a ring, and the ring makes you invisible. Let's make it even a better ring than that. It makes you undetectable in the things you may do to satisfy yourself or to give advantage to your own or whatever uh, as against other people. Which one of us, that's really what Plato asks, which one of us could be sure that we would remain virtuous even did we have the ring of Gyges? Now power, when it's not checked, is like the ring of Gyges. You give people this capacity to do something without, with relative impunity. My worry about the China model is that while there are many people in the system, in the middle government and through the leadership, that all the checking is mutual and all the checking is in-house. Now, I worry that in a system like that, people turn a blind eye to one another's abuses. Uh, the problems that arise are going to be manifold. One is a sort of paternalism, as in we know better, you know, a sense that we're the good guys, you know, we're looking after the people which can, of course, lead to an arrogance that means you actually distrust what you're hearing from the people, and you just go with your... That's already an abuse. Second abuse, of course, is, is the abuse of, of, of nepotism, as we've come to call it, you know, whereby all of us human beings, our deepest natural instinct is to look after our own, to look after our families and our children. And that is something you will... That's in the genes, that's in the DNA, for very good reasons. But it's dangerous when it comes to establishing a state. Because if you give people power, especially power that's not checked from outside, then the, power, the thrust, you know, the push to favor your own gets to be incredibly strong. That's my worry. And of course, the third, apart from paternalistic arrogance or, or nepotism, um, the third problem is always going to be, of course, just looking after yourself. I mean, um, feathering your own nest, you know, it's no surprise that in almost every case of people in every system we've ever known gaining an unchecked power, and there'll be many systems like that, they always end up a lot richer than when they entered that system. That's not an accident. I think that's just simply what you expect. Now, what I worry about the China model is that while the examinations and so on may be a terrific um, if we accept what's happening from Daniel, and I'm prepared to do that, a terrific entry sort of test, it's a high bar to pass and so on, keeping people virtuous is a quite distinct path, uh, uh, task from selecting those who are, who are virtuous. By comparison, actually, on this merit front, so what I'm saying is that I worry that the merit on which the China model makes legitimacy turn is often going to be very hard to preserve, even if you get it at the beginning. The irony is that in the traditional Western model, again going back not just to recent democratic centuries, but right back to the Republican origins of the Western model, uh, there was always an emphasis on economize on virtue. Don't make your system depend on people being virtuous. That's rash, you know? You need to, well, people in the 18th century called it sometimes the knaves principle. 
You need to build a system such that it'll still work well, even should, that's the phrase, even should men turn out to be knaves, even should they be corrupted. Ironically, the Western system seems to be to do better, in a way, in guarding against corruption of merit in that way than the, uh, ironically, because what it focuses on is popular control. But let's look at the other side. What's the prospect of a system really giving people more or less equally shared control? Well, I think that that prospect, for example, in America has been seriously diminished by Citizens United and by the drift of, of Supreme Court decisions that have enabled money to control an awful lot of what happens in politics. And I absolutely uh, agree with you that, there, uh, that it's quite clear that public policy making is much more responsive to the wealthier um, parts of society in the United States than to the poor. We have lots of data on that now, and I think that is a failure. However, I think that the, the Western model in particular does much better in various other incarnations. So, for example, in parliamentary models, it's very hard as a lobby group, for example, to buy over a whole party, which is what you get in the parliamentary system. The whole party, like a group agent, is in power. Uh, in the other system, uh, legislators, the American, legislators can be picked off by lobby groups. Much harder to do that if you've got a whole, a whole uh, party to pick, pick, pick off. And also, in the various non-American versions of democracy who can have campaign finance laws, disclosure laws, and so on, that can be very effective. And it seems to me can, in fact, make it possible to have a great deal of popularly shared control. So on the first question, I think, putting it crudely, Western model one, China model zero, or at least, you know, one half or something, because I'm really not sure that you can ever be sure of merit emerging, whereas you can be better, more sure of popular control emerging. Second question is whether even if it did emerge, let's assume that you can have two systems and they really are meritorious over there because the China model is working well, or there really is popular control over here because the democratic model, the Western model, is working well. Next question is, well, would people be in a position to see that that is so, where it's so? Because it's crucial that they should be able to see that it's so. If they can't see that it's so, it's not going to do the job of legitimating it in their eyes, which is what's really, uh, really important. Well, of course, in the, again, my problem is in the China model, uh, the test for establishing merit is all in-house. It's within the ranks of, the, of those in power. It's in the ranks, within the ranks, effectively, of, um, of the party, uh, of the party machine. Now, that means it's not going to be necessarily manifest to those in the public at large. So even if, by I would think something of a miracle, the Chinese Communist Party devises a system that will really eradicate corruption and put merit in place, is it going to be really credible that it's in place, manifest that it's in place? On the other hand, with popular control, when it is in place, it's going to be preserved under public measures, like, for example, the contestatory measures here or the interactive measures of mutual checking between the different branches of government, and it's going to be, in that sense, much more detectable, much more manifest. So on that second question, I think that the Western model promises to do better as well. But there's a third question, too. What we want in a legitimator of a system is something about the system that makes us feel that even if government shouldn't do so well, say, in the economy, or however, and every government is going to fail to do very well on occasion, because how well a government does is going to be a function of fortune and circumstance, as well as its inherent skill or knowledge. So what you need is a legitimator that will keep the system in place should the government dip and not have continual permanent revolution, if we may cite one of the authors for the original China model. Um, that's important that you don't have that. Otherwise, you'll have great instability. Now, if, the, if there's a dip in the Western model, people have only to blame themselves because we elected this government. And the natural response is, of course, to have a change of government. But a change of government is not a change of regime. So the regime can be relatively stable in response to government underperformance. On the China model, I really worry about what's going to happen. Because uh, suppose there is a real dip, for example, in the Chinese economy, as there may well be one of these years. Uh, first of all, if the legitimation of the system is, we got all these meritorious people in power. Well, hey, wait a moment. If there's a dip, that's going to seem suddenly less persuasive that they're all that meritorious. 
Why is there a dip if they're that meritorious? But secondly, there isn't an option like change the government rather than change the regime. If there is widespread disaffection, how do people react? They can't just change the government. That's not available under the China model. So regime change becomes the salient option, and that creates instability. Let me just finally end with, uh, so I want to say that on these three questions, even if you think merit and control are equal possible potential legitimators of a system, you're more likely in practice to get control than to get merit. If you do get one or the other, you're more likely to find the control being manifest to people, but not the merit, than the merit. And finally, if you're legitimating your system by the control that people have over it, you're going to have a system that is more stable or resilient or robust over dips in government performance than if you have a system that's tied to the alleged merit of those in power. Final question. Is this just a testimony to my lack of acquaintance with this model? After all, I've grown up and lived all my life under West, ver ver variations of the Western model. Well, I say no, because I actually grew up, I exchanged this thought with Daniel earlier, I grew up in the Catholic Church. Um, I was, in fact, a trainee to be a Catholic priest. I know the Catholic Church extremely well. And one thing that actually raises a question for me about the China model is that it's really a model that we might well have called the Vatican model. Because after all, think about how the church operates. Uh, first of all, there's parish democracy. That's like the village democracy. Secondly, middle government. There's entry by means of, of the gray arrows on a meritocratic basis. It's, you, know, it's, it's, you have to pass various exams to get into seminary, to become a priest. You're tested all the time. Not just tested for intellectual, but also for other merits. And then you get to be a priest. And then people get to be, there's a, the middle government is priests and bishops, and bishops are selected on the basis of presumably merit, of various kinds of established, and eventually get into the College of Cardinals, if you know the system, and then the cardinals elect the pope on the basis, from amongst their own number, mem, number on the basis of, of merit. So I am familiar with the meritocratic system. Am I happy with it? No. For obvious reasons. The Catholic Church has not done well in terms of its governance structure. Look, they worried about it in the Middle Ages, so much so they said, here's the thing, we won't allow people to get married who are bishops or priests, and that way we'll avoid, we'll avoid the nepotism. Well, actually, you know, the interesting thing, the word nepotism was invented in that context. Do you know what it comes from? It comes from the Latin nepos, which means nephew, because, of course, as soon as the priests or the uh, bishops, or indeed the popes in that period, uh, could not have children that they could hand on money to because they couldn't officially marry. The children they actually did have out of wedlock became known as nephews, hence nepotism. <laughs> so they didn't get rid of it, nor did they, you know, we have various. Now, that's maybe not so bad with the Catholic Church, you might say, because, at least for adults, because we can leave. We've got a right of exit from the Catholic Church if you're not happy, if you feel you're dominated from within it. The thing is, you don't have the right of exit from a country if you lock it into the China model or something like the China model. So while I am grateful to Daniel for having described this model to us, having presented to us an important antonym to the model that I much prefer, I think of it as a Republican model or a Western model, um, I deeply stick with that model rather than being converted to the Vatican model or the China model. Thank you. Quick response. Uh, that, that was great. Thank you so much. And I'm tempted to say I agree with you, but for purposes of the debate, I, I'll disagree. Um, about the, look, um, the, real, the real question is, is there only one way of selecting top leaders who are to exercise domain, power in a wide range of domains? And you know, the Western model is there's one solution, one person, one vote. doesn't matter about the, whether it's the cultures. It doesn't matter whether it's different level of government, whether it's local government, central government. It's the same system. That's what I'm objecting to you. I think it's a dogmatic and, and, and close-minded view. Um, so, okay, anyway. Why the U.S.? I mean, it's a question of scale here. It's not just culture, scale. A huge country, the tasks of governor are much more challenging, you know, to govern a huge country like China than in Denmark. You know, I could, if you compare Denmark, tiny, you know, few, few million people, you know, homogeneous, with lots of resources. I mean, why not compare Denmark to like the richest part of China? And, and you know, maybe they'll be similar. So the, you have to compare to a big country, 
I could, you mentioned parliamentary system, I could have used India. There's not as much social science on India, but I think, uh, you know, to be frank, China would come out even better if it compares with India rather than with the US. But anyway, um, so scale matters. Legitimacy, I think political culture matters, right? Because of China's political culture, there's much more emphasis and you know, political surveys bear this out. I mean, historians will point this out. You know, on on things like performance, on on a government that will guarantee unity, on on meritocracy for the top leaders. There's consistent support for that. Doesn't that matter? Doesn't political culture matter? Um, on limiting the power, of course, you want to limit the power of rulers. And my book, you know, as you know, has this long section on, on, on limiting, for example, the corruption of rulers. Can you do that without, them, without one person involved? I think there's lots of ways. You know, I mentioned you know, have more peer review in the promotion process, uh, more independent supervisory institutions, uh, higher salaries, you know, learn from Singapore in this sense, but not all the way. Um, more separation of economic and political power, more Confucian moral education instead of Marxism. Lots of ways you can limit it. But at the end of the day, here, culture matters. You know, any government has to do two things. One is use its power to do good things, and two, limit its power to do bad things. How do you draw the line between those two? The US is always, because of its political culture, is going to draw a line more on the limiting power. China more on giving power to do good things. That's just going to be there. And why doesn't political culture matter? I don't understand why, um, why Philip doesn't even consider that, that, that this is an important question. Um, the Catholic Church versus CCP, I mean, they're still different, right? The Communist Party is not really communist. It's this huge organization that meant to select or co-opt the elites from different sectors of society, and that allows for some mobility from outside that organization as well. Of course, there's a big gap between the theory and the practice, but at least it's, and even in theory, it's a huge, it's very, very different than, than, the, uh, than the Catholic Church. So my question really is, is this, you know, doesn't culture matter? Do you, is there just one solution for the, for the whole world when it comes to selection of, of top political leaders? Shouldn't we encourage this diversity and encourage China's experiment to succeed based on its own model, its own leading ideas and its political culture rather than you know, preaching ideas from, uh, fr from the West? You know, and doesn't level of government matter? That's, again, how do you select leaders different levels of government? It matters, right? Local government and central government is going to be very different, I think. Different needs, different qualities matter. And I think in this sense, China does you know, ha have it right. So shouldn't we encourage the Chinese model to succeed rather than just saying that, no, they need to become like us? <laughs> you go I think I'll stay. I think I'll stay here. If, am I? Am I Am I being broadcast? Yes, OK. Um, so why the US? Um, I mean, I can see, Daniel, why you might argue that the US is the only really large-scale democracy apart from, uh, apart from India that compares. And in fact, uh, it might have been um, even less fair, you would say, to have chosen India because of various problems that we know it has. Um, I still think that you know, Germany is a large demo uh, democracy, Britain is large, we're talking about 70, 80 million or whatever. These are uh, well-tested systems. Um, so you know, it, the, the total neglect of the parliamentary system really worries me. The thing about the presidential systems, I see it as this. In the presidential system, as illustrated here, you get these different bodies elected independently. So, the people in the legislature don't have to make common cause in order to keep the executive in power. Whereas in the Westminster system, for example, uh, the parliament, the parties, the people in the legislature, legislature have to make common cause or else the government will fall. That means in turn they form a group agent, as I think of it, the, uh, the party. And that means that they can put forward before the elections, for example, a program of government they're going to follow. And they can be held fairly well to it. In America, no one puts forward a program of government because everyone votes independently in the chamber. They're not tied to the party. And so no one can promise anything. It depends on the backroom deals. So there are many faults in the US system that are specific to that particular way of organizing things. Again, as I mentioned, the lobby group can pick off individuals in the US system, so the lobby industry is enormous. In the other system, lobby groups are much smaller because you can't expect to be able to just buy off, so to speak, the favor of a whole party, whereas you come with an individual. One thing to, to say, though, you mentioned that why have, should all the leaders be, be elected? I mean, do we, uh, 
uh, given that you know, we know that sometimes they're not exactly to our taste um, or even draw our admiration. I want to insist that the leaders in a democratic system, that, as I think of it, in this sort of Western system, they include the people, the oddsbuds men or women, um, the statistics, the auditors, the, um, uh, the people on the courts, the people in the central bank, the people in the various regulatory agencies, uh, and after all, those are the vast majority of people involved in the apparatus of government. They're given strict briefs, they're given strict constraints, they're at arm's length from government, they can't be influenced by party pressures, ideally, but they combine in a pattern that overall can make for a system where we are, the people are in control. Now, you mention in China there's consistent support for the way things are done, but that's majoritarian support. As we know, the odd individual who differs about things, and it's not an odd individual, uh, puts his or her head above the parapet, very quickly gets locked away. Now, maybe in your ideal system that wouldn't happen, but I don't see anything in your ideal Definitely system not, maybe. that would allow that person to have a solid voice, a voice that might be, for example, uttered in the courts. If he or she thinks they can bring the government to court, that can be backed up in a class action and so on, that can be magnified through a political party or an NGO. That actually is what I think of as, I always said, relatively equally shared popular support. You're, it's not enough that people in general think the government are doing a good job. Uh, it's the fact that those out on the edges can, if they wish, make their voices heard, heard as well. Um, one concession I do want to make, and I didn't make it clear in my talk, is I do think that a system of the kind you, you describe, and that China in the last 30 years exemplifies, but not the previous 30 years. That must be emphasized. There wasn't a massive change of constitution that led to Deng Ching and, and so on coming into, into power. It was just a change within the existing structure. So the structure is capable of delivering that. Now, not your structure, in fairness, where it's written into the structure that it's meritocratic. Still, Mao would have thought he was meritocratic, I guess, too. But the one thing I do want to concede is, if you're starting from a very bad place, like a lot of corruption, a lot of poverty, it may well be that the best way of getting from there to a more prosperous, you know, less corrupt sort of system may be um, by having a very powerful leader, for example, like uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew in, in Singapore, for example, who can actually shift things along rapidly. But I think it's one thing to think that's good for that sort of transition period. It's another thing to think that it's a model for continuing government into the future indefinitely, where government performance will shift and the crises will mount and the challenges we know government will face will, will open up. Um, you, finally, just one thing about level of government. I'm not actually one of those who thinks that local democracy is the be all and end all. So for example, in Australia, I'm sure something similar happens here. Um, there was a move um, some decades ago whereby zoning of property was taken out of the state government, that's uh, of the various states from, say, Sydney and New South Wales, and given to local governments. And this was presented as giving democracy back to the people at local level. But what happens then? Well, what happens, of course, is that the decisions made by local government are really not all that important, except for the zoning ones. The people really interested in the zoning issues are people with an interest in real estate. So you get an over-representation of people who are involved in the real estate business, which actually leads to a sort of corruption of a curious sort. It's interesting that you yourself say about the village system, democracy in, in, um, in China, that that's where the real complaints are about people. They're always complaining about their, their local... I think in many cases, decisions are best made, even democratic decisions, meaning the, the people are in control at some or higher up level. Or take an American case, you know, school, school funds are provided by local government in America, uh, rather than by state government, let alone federal government in general. Uh, what does that lead to? Well, it leads to uh, one area gets to be relatively wealthy, um, it's got more money to spend on its school, it develops its school, then people want to move in with children, that makes the houses even more expensive and the school even better, but of course the obverse of that is there are other areas where the schools are falling, the houses are low in price, there are more poor people there, and you actually end up with a very skewed system of public education, all a result of excessively local democracy. Mm -hmm.
I think democracy has to be systemic with many, many channels, as there are channels here, legislative and the unelected, and contestatory as well as electoral. And it's only in virtue of that sort of really complex type system with many different points of pressure that you can expect to get something like popular control. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, we'd like to turn the discussion over to the audience. So please come forward. I think the mics should be working. Hello? No. Is it? Is it? Yes. Um, this is a question for both of you, and thank you again uh, for your debate. It's very interesting. Um, how would meritocracy um, vers uh, play on the international and geopolitical level? Um, would meritocracies, um, different meritocratic nation states, uh, wor um, work e with each other in the same kind of dynamics that democracies are expected to work under in the, under the democratic peace theory? Would you have, let's say, a meritocratic peace theory, or is that something that we could not expect at all from a meritocratic, like, dominated world? Okay. Uh, should we take them one by one? Okay. Okay, we'll take them. Uh, we'll take three at a time, I think, just to, in, in the interest of time. So we'll take three questions. Uh, so the next one, and then one over here. If there's, no, I can't quite see around. Great. Um, hi, this is for Philip. Um, I just wanted to ask you, if the China model could add a few more triangles, if you could see it working, and specifically a merit triangle that could actually select the most merited people to join the executive part of the government. I, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. I didn't really what I was happen. asking was if you took the China model yes. and added the other triangles from the Western model right. to it, okay. is that a way that that model could succeed? Good, good, good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hi. My name is Molly and I'm a student here at Yale and US. I was wondering, we've heard a lot of arguments for why uh, the model might not work in theory and why it might work in theory, and I'm interested in the practical uh, side of it. So I was gl I'm glad that you brought up India uh, as an example, because that's a, pop uh, a state that has this sort of the same population as China. Um, and second, we need to uh, understand the principle why a person would want to go into a contract with a state. It's to give up some of its freedom in exchange for uh, protection, security. So I'm wondering, my question to both speakers are, so which state in practice today, China or India, um, India being a liberal democracy, China being of the, uh, the China model, does in practice provide the security the best way, the security of the population. Okay, um, so thank you. Well, two, two of the questions were directed at least partly at me. So um, about different, can we imagine, you know, we can act, imagine this kind of democracies getting together, favoring this international peace, a great idea. Um, what about meritocracies? The thing about Democracy, in, the, in some sense, just, I'm just here talking about electoral democracy. Generally, governments elected by free and fair elections. It's not that hard to do. You can do it even, even in a like, terribly chaotic and civil country. You can have elections, right? Afghanistan, Iraq, whether it'll lead to good results is a separate question. But meritocracy is difficult. It has, requires, to be frank, a history of bureaucratic institutions that's much easier to draw upon. You know, in, in China, as Philip said, you had this Maoist interlude, but in the grand scheme of things, you have this long history of, we can call it bureaucratic rule, that's kind of easy to draw upon when, it, when, when decisions made to reestablish something like it. Um, and it, it takes years, if not decades, to establish it in a kind of semi-functional way. It's not like elections where it, you can do it pretty quickly. So, so if, it, so it, in other words, there's not many countries outside of China and maybe places that are inspired by Chinese culture a bit, like Singapore, you know, that have a very strong meritocratic foundation. So it's hard to imagine 
uh, those countries getting together in some sort of global you know, coalition. That said, I think it's great that aspects of the meritocratic uh, government can be you know, export and maybe learn from other countries. And now in China, you know, many, like in some of the government institutions and universities, um, you have, you know, uh, you have administrators coming from, you know, African countries or, or South Asia sometimes, or even Latin America to study, you know, how, how things are, how administration is dealt with, how, how poverty alleviation could work best and so on. So parts of it can be exported abroad, but the whole meritocratic package is very difficult to export or if you don't have this history of, of, of meritocracy, and, and also a terrible experience with populism, right? I mean, like the Cultural Revolution was like a populism gone mad, of course, and arbitrary dictatorship. And they said, we don't want that anymore. We need to have a strong meritocratic foundation, you know, with collective leadership, term and age limits, you know, those that, that and to, to, so China has a very distinctive, you know, uh, culture and history, and, and, and countries that lack it, um, I think uh, it's very hard for, to imagine those countries getting together and forming some sort of meritocratic coalition. I hope I'm wrong. Maybe in the future there'll be, you know, the pro-democracy coalition, pro-meritocracy coalition, all of them favoring international peace. That would be great. But uh, I don't just see, I don't see that happening in the next few years anyway. Um, China and India about security. I mean, look, what did China do well? You know, it's, it's worth emphasizing because in the Western media, sorry if it sounds polemical, all you read about 90% of the time is the bad news. You know, Lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, you know, estimated up to half a billion, and no war since 1979. I mean, compare that again, sorry, to the U.S., you know. Okay, what about private security, you know, meaning just the right to life or the right not to be subject to, you know, arbitrary death at the hands of other people? I think China, the cities are pretty safe, even without a heavy military or police presence, you know. And women are generally safe in China compared to India. So on those grounds, I think, you know, China has a pretty good track record. Very briefly, on the democratic peace, I mean, I, it is very striking, I mean, uh, as um, um, Michael Doyle has argued, that democracies have gone to war less with one another, and less indeed with other regimes than non-democratic societies have done. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. I mean, I, the argument is, of course, that in a democracy, people are less inclined to um, uh, to, to go to war because they're going to suffer, whereas in, for example, monarchy, the king may actually not worry very much about the subjects he's going to lose. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's an empirical thesis. The trouble is the data are so short, you know, I mean, after all, we haven't had democracies that long. Um, and as Daniel says, actually, the U.S. isn't a great example. Um, so I'm not inclined to put a great weight on the democratic thesis. The, thesis myself, and um, I, I don't see any reason to think that meritocracies would do any better. Uh, perhaps they would do worse. I mean, maybe I should hold my end up there, but, uh, but I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a line ball call, as they say in, in rugby. Um, on mixing the China model, so the suggestion was that you have the central uh, triangle just as it is. Let's say it replaces these three triangles here. But then you have these other bodies, which, like the central one, are going to be non-elected, but they have an adversarial or a potentially adversarial relationship with the central body. And there are two aspects to democracy, apart from its electoral aspect, of course, which is that there is this, there are different centers of power. It's multi-centered. Uh, and there's a contestatory element of people being able not just to elect a government, but to challenge what's happening in government via the courts, via demonstrations, via the newspapers, via the NGOs, and so on. Now, I think that what you're, I forget who raised this question, I can't see the person, but um, what the suggestion was that you don't have the contestatory element, but at least you have the adversarial element. You know, you put that in. Well, I would have said that certainly for the good. I don't know how stable it would be. Um, I mean, how are these bodies appointed to? That's not, it's not clear to me. I suppose there's a different entry point and they, they arise therefore as like different uh, hereditary groups almost, except now they're meritocratically selected. It's very hard for me to imagine actually how it would operate. But if it could operate, if you really could have bodies in, in that mutually checking sort of relationship, I think that would 
that would give me a certain sense of security or assurance where I'm living under that system, rather than living under a system where really they all clump together in a hierarchy, those who are in the ruling class. Then, if I'm on the outside, I know I'm on the outside. I know that I'm subject to a sort of decision that may be subject to an in-house meritocratic sort of, re but from my point of view, it's not going to be all that uh, credible or manifest. On the last question about, I, wasn't, I didn't quite catch the question, to tell the truth, um, about the um, uh, one question I did hear, but may not be the question raised, was that when you talked about security, it was internal security, I mean, as in social security, educational security, judicial security, the security of a citizen in relation to their, uh, to their political system. And, um, and the question, as I understood it then, was what systems actually uh, exemplify something like the ideal that I have in mind. Well, I think there are going to be three aspects that are really important to a system doing well. One is that you've got a good electoral system, meaning by that, in my terms, a system where there is not control by money um, of the sort that, you know, is more and more, alas, uh, seeming to happen in the United States. I'm sure in the longer run that will change in the US. I hope it will, uh, but of course, we won't all be around in the longer run, unfortunately. Um, but you need a system with campaign finance, and I think you need a parliamentary system, because otherwise we each elect our own representative, and God knows what's going to happen you know, when they get behind closed doors. Whereas if you elect a party, you at least know what they're going to be doing in government. You can judge in advance what their programs are. Second element, you need a good contestatory culture. And that means you need a lot of NGOs, and you need a total assurance that you are free to protest, free to be an outlier, free to be an outsider, so to speak, challenging the system, and that you will still be able to thrive in that society. And the third is constitutional, that there really are bodies of this kind that mutually check one another within the overall apparatus of government. Now, I actually think there are many systems, uh, democratic systems, that do quite well uh, on all of these counts, and I think they do quite well as systems overall. Uh, for example, I believe the Australian system works very well. I think the Canadian system works well, as far as I know it. I know it less well than the Australian. I think the Nordic systems in, in, in Europe, I think Britain works pretty well. All of these, I think, work much better as democracies, in my sense, uh, than does the United States, unfortunately. But there are lots of good examples of, the, of what I think of as the, uh, as the Western model. It's not just an ideal. S smaller democracies. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. Any big models, big democracies that work well in your view? <laughs> well, but that's unfair, Daniel. I mean, to simply say, oh, we can only look at democracies more than 250 million, you know, our, our systems, aren't, because China is that. But your China model is supposed to work, you talk at the, in the last chapter about it's being exportable, being capable of being used in other societies. But you don't require that it be a society of more than 200 million or, or a billion people. And it, presumably, if the model works, it can work it can scale, scale down as well as scaling up. Mm. Uh, now, I think that democracy can scale up as well. I think actually the federal aspect of the system in the United States is fine. It's just that the problems I've talked about, which are not a function of size, because they're, they're replicated in each state, or at least in most states, right, which are much smaller, rather than, as well as being problems that affect the federal system as a whole. We're going to take two questions from over here and then one from I over there. I find it very hard not to see these yeah, people. Yeah, I know. The podium is not <laughs> in a good place. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Francesca. I'm a student here at Yale US. So my question is about meritocracy. Um, I think I see a very big issue with meritocracy, which I think is kind of the elephant in the room when we talk about this system, which is how do we measure, how do we assess merit? And I see two problems with it. The first one being who decides, who devises the process to select the new leaders, the new leaders that are virtuous and, and have merit. Because if that's the old leaders, then how are we sure that this, this process that is being devised is fair and it's not in favor of the people who are already in power? And the second question is, how can we select based on merit in general? So is it, if we have, say, a written examination that maybe measures knowledge or academic achievement and so on, is that effective in measuring ethics and virtue? And because I, if these two problems cannot be solved, then 
even if meritocracy is maybe the best system in theory, then I don't see it working in practice if the, the major issue of selecting people is not, does not work in a fair way. Hi, uh, this, uh, this uh, question's for Professor Bell. Um, I guess uh, it's sort of implied by some of the, the comments from, uh, uh, from Professor Pettit, but what role do you see uh, voice, particularly uh, voices in opposition to, to government policy in your ideal China model and how that functions uh, in practice now? Uh, I'm kind of interested in particular where you'd mentioned the government, or there, there's aspects of government to, the, uh, to limit the ability to do bad and to have the power to do good, but then where do the, where, what inputs are, are, are seen to, to, to help decide what is uh, the good policy uh, to be made? Thanks. Hello, and thank you to both speakers. Uh, I wanted to ask both speakers to address the value of political experimentation, uh, which is a value that Professor uh, Bell brought up before. And I definitely see the Western model as a safe and stable one. Uh, but in this Republican view of the Western model, I'm afraid that minority groups who can only build tenuous coalitions will be unable to maintain and affect the uh, change that they re require to overcome the balancing of the institutional factors at play. Uh, and particularly, the multiplication of veto points is particularly concerning in the Western model. And for Professor Bell, uh, when the party officials evaluate party members on party merits, uh, I'm worried that the uh, even the middle government level that you identified as being a possible ground for experimentation will be filled with leaders who are either unable conceptually to experiment alternatives or unable in practice because of their own desires. Okay. So, uh, great questions, very hard to answer in a few minutes. Um, you know, one, th um, I, I do think political experimentation is so important. It's one of the great, to be frank, virtues of the Chinese system because, you know, when, for, again, I'm sorry, I don't always want to compare to the U.S., but when the U.S. constitutional system was established, things were more or less stable, you know, kind of agricultural study on the way to being a bit industrial, but you can establish this fixed system, it's hard to change, but now the world changes so fast, you know, scientific innovations, now I'm, at this term I'm in Silicon Valley, you know, people talk about new technologies that are going to change what it means to be human, or it's, which can sometimes get out of control. You need to have lots of innovation and experimentation and open, openness regarding the constitutional system. And I do think in this sense, China, you know, has, at least in principle, has this part right. Um, who decides whether the experiments work? I agree, that's a big problem. That this, it's quite politicized and, and, and there's a need for, you know, much more uh, independent, you know, and expert and, and open assessment of the success um, of experiments. And I, I do hope, you know, at, you did have some, you know, leaders who were, you know, forward-looking, innovative, and who had the power to kind of implement good changes based on local level experiments. But once the system becomes very politicized and untransparent, it's, it's not a, a very healthy situation. And I, so I do think, um, and this goes back to the, the, the question about voices in opposition. I'm totally in favor of much more open government in China, an open political system. All I'm questioning is one person, one vote as a way of choosing leaders, but all the other democratic values and practices that we know I think are, are needed in China, including much more, um, much more freedom of speech, you know, because that's the only way in which you can criticize things that go wrong and, and, and suggest improvements. Um, and why are they so restrictive now? I mean, there's many reasons. One is, I think, you know, re more recently, uh, because of the anti-corruption campaign, there's lots of enemies against the current leaders, even more paranoid than usual. Now this is a period of very, you know, economic reform. Again, have to go after vested interests, makes the leaders more paranoid. You know, the good part, uh, if they may be optimistic, uh, part which may be wrong is that you know once you settle these issues then you can pr you can proceed to what is a much more you know healthy and open environment and at some point I do think that's you know as society modernizes the government can decide everything they need to you know allow much more multiple sources of contestation and also if only to like diffuse responsibility when things go wrong you know you can't always now when things go wrong they tend to blame the government right away there's a need for much more diffusion of responsibility for that purpose too um, so it has to become uh, more open in that sense. I think you can do that while still preserving the virtues uh, of, of the meritocratic system. Um, and at some point, you know, there might even be a need for a more, more like strong democratic legitimacy. And in the book, I suggest maybe 15 years from now, some sort of, you know, referendum, free and open referendum. Do you favor this vertical democratic meritocracy? If there's a large majority of people who, who, who vote for it, then 
and for, and for like a 50-year period, then the government could just relax and let those people argue about alternatives. They don't have to put them in jail anymore because it will be clear that they only represent tiny minority people and it's not going to spread. And so I, I'm all in favor of that. You know, so my views actually are not, that's why, you know, not, not to be frank, strongly in support of, of the status quo. Um, uh, now how to assess merit, again, I have a whole chapter on, on that in, in the book, you know, and, and it draws on, on history, on social science, as well as on philosophical argumentation. I argue there are three main sources of merit uh, for political leaders that are important no matter what the situation in a large country at the city level and above that's relatively peaceful, that's above average intelligence, for that exams are helpful, above average social skills, performance evaluations at lower levels of government is helpful. And virtue, and for that, I just mean again, not corrupt, at least partly committed to, the common, to serving the public and not misusing public funds for one's own interest. And there are many different ways of dealing with that. Examinations are not helpful, you know, but more peer review is helpful because now in the promotion process, the boss decides typically, and that's, you know, the, and they don't often see the people who have bad moral character, you know, higher salaries, more separation of economic and political power, more independent supervisory institutions, more moral education. You can do all that without democratic elections, which, which I think is, is a good thing. And as well as having more, um, you know, again, I don't think, I don't, this whole idea of this closed system is also not very healthy. It's important to have regularized procedures for promotion, but because the sources of merit and what counts as merit differs, you also want to allow for lots of experimentation on that. And sometimes for people to come in through these non-mainstream channels, in order to uh, serve the community. And here, John Stuart Mill had it right, you know, that freedom of speech is not important just because uh, to correct mistakes, but also to identify the new source, the new elites that otherwise would be, you know, hidden from, from public view if they didn't have the freedom of speech. So I, I think that's another reason to favor more freedom of speech in the system. Let me take the um, uh, questions in, in the other order, the order in which they're given. So I, I think on the issue of who decides, of course this was a question mainly for, for Daniel, but if I can just say, I think society can operate very well under a constitution that perhaps were not democratically in, introduced. For example, Germany and Japan are, are examples post-war, but it's very important for each of those countries, in my point of view, that the constitution remains capable of being fundamentally revised should there be a push against it, because there's a, a mode whereby with uh, almost all the articles of each constitution, uh, the people can actually get it changed. Um, once it's there, so to speak, as something that the people can exit from, even if they didn't choose to enter it voluntarily, they can voluntarily exit from it according to pre prescribed procedures. That means that they, to a certain extent in any case, are in control. They own the constitution. Now, I can't see any system determining you know, who decides what and on what basis that can really have roots in people's hearts other than a constitution of which it's a matter of common knowledge that we could get together to change it if we think it isn't working well. Now Daniel does allow that, but 50 years seems to me to, um, I mean, I think there should always be a possibility of that constitutional amendment and just we voted in for 50 years. I mean, most of those who voted in are dead by the time you know, it, it comes up for possible renewal. That doesn't seem to me to be satisfactory. Let me just say, though, in that context, that I think a failure by my lights in many democratic systems is that it's too hard to amend the Constitution. I think it should be relatively hard. I don't think it should be a straight majoritarian vote, but it should not be as hard, for example, as, as, as it is under Article 5 of the US Constitution, or indeed as hard as it is in Australia either. On opposition voices, I mean, Daniel and I agree a lot. We, we think there shouldn't be corruption. You know, we don't, we don't disagree on that. We equally think that um, it should be good that people are prepared to speak out, that there are opposition voices. But we differ on the preconditions necessary to make all of that possible. See, my sense is that people are never going to speak out unless they know, they know it isn't just a matter of faith, that they are, um, proof against uh, the displeasure of those they speak out against. Uh, in the China model, I don't really see how ordinary folk who have no say in who gets into government, it's just they believe they're all meritorious because they've gone through this nice system, are going to really be prepared to speak out against, say, the family of a very high official um, on the grounds that, well, our system allows that. Yeah, you, maybe I can see all sorts of safeguards you can put in place, but 
Ultimately, I think you really have to have the sort of thing we do get in the Western model, which is we are conscious of our freedoms. We are aware of the courts being independent of the government. We are aware of being able to go to court. We're aware of being able to make common cause with other people who share our complaint in NGOs or whatever, or within political parties. And knowing that, we know that we can speak out without fear, without reason for fear or deference. I mean, I sometimes use a, a, a sort of, um, a, it's really a very rough heuristic or test for when a society really passes this criterion of there being opposition voices and where people can feel free, and that is what I call the eyeball test. It actually belongs with the old Republican tradition going from Republican Rome, as I think of it, and that's the test under which you know you live in a society where you can speak out, when you can look people in the eye without reason for fear or deference, you know, by the toughest local standards. You, they may be wealthier than you, they may be bigger than you, you know, they may be better connected than you, they may be part of the majority ethnicity rather than a minority one, but if you know you can look them in the eye without reason for fear or deference, then you know that you live in a pretty good society, uh, doing pretty well in these kinds. I do not see how the China model would deliver that assurance of being able to look people in the eye without reason for fear or deference. The final issue about experiment, I'm, I, I deeply believe that we should, for example, should be easier to amend a constitution and that there should be capacity for experimentation in various policy-making areas. I mean, we do have to a certain extent, we do have that in the Western model, but actually not as much as I'd like to see it, uh, you know, witness that we have it. I mean, we do have, for example, restorative justice movements that are spreading rapidly in the um, in, in many countries, for example, that seem to be promise a, a real reform within the, uh, uh, within the judicial system. Um, we've had other experiments, unfortunately, that aren't working out very well. It's very important we be able to reverse them. So, for example, we experimented in the last 20 or 30 years with creating a financial industry that has a sort of autonomy that would not have been dreamt of 30 or 40 years ago, uh, you know, whereby banks become at once investment banks and depositor banks, they're just all the same, whereby they can securitize or lump together, you know, the products that they're selling, so that it becomes relatively opaque, what it is you're actually investing in, with rating agencies that are basically in their pocket and rate things well, when really they ought not to be rated well. That system, which we experimented with and developed, is, I think, working very ill. But we're trying to revise it, and various countries have done more or less successfully. They're fighting back, of course, from that financial industry that we built up, now 7 or 8 percent of the U.S. economy, where it used to be less than 1 percent. Uh, they're fighting back, but hopefully, you know, democratic, I would wish, that, you know, the sort of thing that people as a whole would support would actually win out in that. But you, it's, an inc it's an example where there is experimentation, but what you also need as well as experimentation is a possibility of, you know, pulling back when you find the experiment isn't going so well. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time, so I'm going to ask our MC to come up and officially close the debate. C can I make one last comment? Yes. <laughs> Just, this looking in the eye is not the mother of all values. Many other things matter, including maintaining social harmony. And to be frank, it's a little bit West-centric. I mean, even in you know, democratic states like Japan, people don't look at each other in the eye, right? Based on age, you know, you, you bow to them, you know? This idea that... So, uh, anyway. I, <laughs> You, you'd prefer kowtow? I think uh, uh, respectful bowing uh, as a way of showing um, some civility to the, to the elderly is a perfectly good thing. Why should I have to look them in the eye and like, stare at them in the eye? I just don't get it. You know? <laughs> bow, bowing when you're free not to bow is one thing. Bowing when you really run the risk of displeasing someone if you don't bow sure. is quite a different thing. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, whether we bow or we look at each other in the eye, I think we can all agree that we've enjoyed a very rich debate tonight. Thank you, Professors Bell and Petit, for joining us, and thank you, Professor Tanopolsky, for moderating. This concludes our event. Stay tuned for news for our next President Speaker Series in January. <laughs>